Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Lee Whitmore. I'm the Vice President for Education for Focusrite in the Americas, and welcome. This is our inaugural Focusrite in Education webinar, and we have an amazing panel lineup for conversation today. I'm so happy you could all join us. We will be talking about career and technical education, CTE programs, and I am so pleased to have leaders from across the United States, from California, from Ohio, from Connecticut and the East Coast, and they do amazing things. We'll talk about technology, we'll talk about careers, we'll talk about what it means to build and maintain a career and technical education program. And we, um, we're just gonna have a lot of fun. And with any, any further ado, we're gonna just bring our panel in here and start the conversation off. We um, at Focus Right are fortunate to be leaders in audio, music, creation, production, post-production. Um, but you know what? What's most important is our connection to what the creator does, to support the creation of really wonderful content with young people to develop career skills for all of them. We're gonna talk about audio, music, what it means to get a job, what some of the graduates from our panelists programs are doing and their opinions on what really needs to happen in career and technical education. So to start it off, um, we're gonna do quick introductions. Uh, from each of our programs. We've got four represented here today. And Dr. Barb Friedman, let's start with you. Hello. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Barbara Friedman, and I teach electronic music and audio engineering at Greenwich High School in Greenwich, Connecticut. It's basically a, a, sub a suburb of New York City. Uh, I have been teaching here since 2001. This program here in Greenwich has... Um, uh, started its program in 1969. So we've been doing electronic music here for a long time. It looked a lot different back then. So uh, I'm really uh, thrilled to be here. I love my program and my kids. And um, that's, you know, we're quite unique. And hello. <laughs> Barb, it's great to have you here. Next Thank up, you. let's hear a little bit from Dr. Milton Ruffin. Milton, tell us where you're from, what your role is, and about your program, and who your colleague is here today with us. Yes, hello. My name is Milt Ruffin. I'm originally from Youngstown, Ohio, but I've been living in Columbus, oh, for almost 40 years because I'm an Ohio State Buckeye. So those of you out there, O-H-I-O. Uh, <laughs> yes, I'm the principal and director at the Fort Hayes Metropolitan Education Center. In Columbus, we have the largest uh, school district in the state of Ohio. And our school is really unique because it's a high school, comprehensive uh, high school with an arts focus, also a career center combined. So we have about 200, I mean, about 2000 students in our program. And our program, again, is arts focused on the high school side and on the career technical side, we have a four cluster model, which would be a visual and performing arts uh, cluster, arts, cluster, visual, uh, an arts cluster, a health cluster, and a construction cluster. <laughs> so it's a really cool, uh, creative place, and it's full of uh, people who uh, who want to create and, and, uh, and, and are just real different and innovative. And so it's an exciting place to be. So Fort Hayes Metropolitan Education Center in Columbus, Ohio. And Milton, who's with you today from your program? Okay, we have one of our teachers here who is a brilliant young man who uh, has a lot of firsts behind his name or in front of his name. And uh, so we have our audio engineering teacher, uh, Mr. Ryan Van Bibber. Hi there. Uh, my name is Ryan Van Bibber. And as Dr. Ruffin just said, I teach audio production here. Uh, before I did this, I was a middle school band director for 10 years. So uh, my training is in music education. And then um, I've sort of fell into this job and uh, trained myself in all aspects of audio and electronic music. And now uh, Fort Hayes is proud to be um, an avid learning partner school. Uh, we offer Pro Tools certifications at the 100 and 200 level. Uh, we are part of the Ableton Push Initiative. We are now part of this wonderful uh, Focusrite Innovation Launchpad Initiative. 
And we have a lot of other things going for us. And the students here get a great comprehensive, wide breadth uh, audio education. Brian, great to have you with us today. Next up, we've got a dear friend of mine, Ross Callen, who I met as an Apple Distinguished Educator back in the early to mid-2000s. Ross, tell us about your district and about your program and a little bit about you. Wow, that's uh, it's been a long time, hasn't it? Well, <clears throat> I met Lee at Walker Creek, and we were doing some interesting things uh, in the early and mid-2000s. Uh, but before that, I was a music teacher. Uh, I was uh, our orchestra director. I'm at Rancho Bernardo High School in San Diego, California, in the Poway Unified School District. And as a musician, I had initiated some recording arts uh, projects and some recording projects and mastering and back in the day with CDs and all that. And uh, along the way, I was at, um, I crossed over into video land. And when I saw that uh, on the audio side that you could actually see a waveform on a computer and edit music. It just made sense. You know what's it's like, hey, it's like a paragraph. If you edit here and there, it's, it's it, it, I really saw the power of, uh, you know, a digital workstation versus tape and all that. And then when it transitioned to uh, video and I was asked to teach a, a, a TV course, I thought, oh, my gosh, you can see the lips move. How easy is that to edit? So it it really allowed me to help um, students run. And my, my philosophy is if you put, you know, professional tools in the hands of kids, they won't think uh, outside, the, the outside the box. They'll say, where's the box and what are you talking about? And they'll just run. So since then, I've initiated a uh, kind of a, uh, a cinema program, a live production program, and a broadcast journalism program. And we weave in a uh, significant audio component into that. And some of my students have gone on into career paths and they've been uh, in, in the, on the audio engineering side of it. They come back and share with kids and do workshops and seminars uh, for them. And this is um, the connection into pro audio for me has always been a passion of mine, but it also I think uh, allows me to cross over back into the instrumental side of things and really do some amazing things with kids. So I've been doing this for uh, my program started in 1999. So we've been at it a while. And uh, I too, like Barb, feel it's, it's an amazing, unique opportunity for, for kids. <clears throat> Thanks, Ross. It's great to have you join us today. And last but not least, we have uh, our friends from Lawndale High School. Let's start with Luis Rodriguez. And then Luis, you can introduce your colleague. Tell us a little bit about where you are, what your program is about, and uh, about your students. Sure. Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining in. My name is Luis Rodriguez. I am the director of a commercial music pathway at Lawndale High School in South Bay, California. Um, I guess I'm the green one here. Like, uh, I've only been doing this for about uh, 10 years now. I started teaching 2011. Um, I have my CTE credential in arts, media and entertainment. I started off uh, helping develop a technical theater program at our school. Our school has a large theater called the CVCA, Centinella Valley Center for the Arts, uh, 50 by 50 proscenium opening with 40 line sets. Um, we have lighting and sound and everything you could pretty much think of. So helped develop that alongside some teachers, was also part of uh, the digital video design, um, I guess, education program we have at our school too. We have an academy for cinematic arts called the ACA, which I was a part of for a bit as well. And uh, I was in charge of drumline for a couple of years too. Um, I'm a percussionist. Uh, that's where I come from when it comes to music. And I also studied engineering, uh, computer engineering in school and computer technologies. I was part of IT for a really long time. So I have a lot of uh, experience when it comes to merging technology and creativity. And within the commercial music pathway, I've been working on uh, trying to just teach kids how to leverage all of the stuff that is available to them from uh, very simple, accessible technologies like their phones and computers uh, and just free DAWs like GarageBand, BandLab, and um, what's the other one? Soundtrap uh, to, you know, hopefully getting them to a point where they understand how to use Logic and they understand how to set up a live show and uh, perform in front of people. Uh, I teach 
guitar, uh, keyboard, bass, drums, and vocals on top of, you know, how to run a mixer, signal chaining, how to process sound. Uh, and the goal is to just get them to understand a lot about the technology. This year, due to COVID, we've been, we kind of pivoted and we've been focusing a lot more on songwriting, which is something I'm definitely going to carry on, uh, making sure they learn how to have some sort of narrative behind their story that connects with their audience and make sure that their music supports that narrative. Um, yeah, I'm really excited to be here and learn from everyone else because uh, there's plenty, there's a lot of, of knowledge here that I'm, I'm hoping to take back with me and uh, improve my program. Uh, and uh, up next, I, we have Leticia who supports our program. She is, uh, I'll let her explain <laughs> so I don't take them all, I'll, I don't take the words out of her mouth. Fantastic. Leticia, tell us about your role in the program. Hi, everybody. So my name is Leticia Rojas. I am a CTE pathway specialist here at Lawndale High School. Uh, so what that means is I'm the career technical education um, support specialist, pretty much. And so I work with not just commercial music, but other academies that are at our high school. We have three other academies. And so I work with them um, in their yearly goals um, in terms of making sure that their program has what they need in order to run, connecting them with other organizations or industry partners and um, trying to seek opportunities for those programs. Uh, this is actually my first year doing that. I am a teacher. Um, so this year I'm a teacher on special assignment. Uh, I, I don't come from the music background, but very, very close. I, am, I was a visual arts teacher for seven years. And so this is my eighth year um, in education and uh, my first year working with this academy. Um, I've worked with Luis before in terms of like being in the same department and just seeing the program grow. Um, but I'm very lucky to be able to actually be a part of it this year. Fantastic, Leticia. Welcome, everybody. How cool. What a great panel. I can't wait to cover what we're going to cover today in the conversation, which three topical areas, everyone, our audience that I shared with our panelists that we'll talk about Generally, I'm sure that organic conversation will spring from this. We've got a, a lot of amazing experience here in the panel today, but we'll start off talking a little bit about, you know, what is CTE for career tech ed edu education for audio, for music? What's it mean? Having spent time with each of our panelists and knowing something about their programs, they approach their work differently. Um, but I think everyone's end goal is similar, um, a successful and meaningful experience for their students. Then we'll dig in a little bit into the nuts and bolts. One of the things that um, helped to inspire this conversation today is, you know, with COVID, with challenges, with funding and opportunity, because things are changing in classrooms and in programs today, you know, where's your funding coming from? What's your facility look like or your facilities? Um, we'll cover everything um, from labs, one-to-one uh, -one with uh, computers and, and gear, I.O., and, uh, and more, studios. I think, Ross, we might even talk about the football field. Uh, <laughs> and then I think everybody in our audience wants to know, what's, what's the end game? What's the outcome? I know you're doing amazing things with your students. And so th third, topically, will be I'll, uh, I'll ask you to share a little bit about what's, what's happened in your programs over the years and what are your students doing today. But to kick it off, let's do this. Um, Ross, I'm going to come to you because if I remember correctly, you have played a role in California State Education in your career in tech ed focus and you have some history there. So could you tell us a little bit, um, because you've been working in this space for a while, about you know what is CTE for you? What do you know from your experience in the state of California and my, what might you want the audience to hear about that progression of what CTE has been for audio and for media over the years? Well, I would say uh, first off, um, as, as I get, became involved recently due to COVID when things started to shut down, here I am, and I assume most of us were, with a really nice facility going, what are we going to do? And a colleague of mine, I was supposed to present at another conference called NAB, and they were saying, Shh, tell us about your program and all this stuff. And you have this, and, and, and I just went, what do you mean? Uh, they can't be here. And it was, I was just in a place where 
what am I going to do? And chaos. And you sit there. And I think what I, I heard Luis go into that too, when you think about it, you're like, react, solve problems, keep it kid centric. How do we make it as meaningful as we can to them? Uh, you know, with, without that. So it really made us pivot in a big way. So one of the conversation points I wanted to have with CTE and at the, at the state level is what's happening with that, reaching out to my colleagues and getting some uh, thought groups together and seeing where, how we're going to pivot. And it was great to connect uh, with some of those organizations. And I can tell you that CTE is career and technical education. And specifically, there's an AME uh, arts, media, and entertainment uh, track uh, uh, pathway uh, for the state of California. And a lot of that's uh, national as well. And I can tell you at the state level, what they did is, and, and there has been tracks. And to be honest, I had, had not been involved at, at the, I was involved in some national conferences, but not as much at the state level. And it gave me a a great connection point to connect to so, so see some one of the see what some of the other programs were doing and how they're resolving this this challenge we had and i think what it helped is kind of refocus and get some conversations going uh, across our partnerships i think in the audio specifically the audio side of it there's been a time to um, collaborate reach out to colleagues and see what each other are doing. And also some of that conversation was discussing funding sources. What resources are there? And I'm sure each of us in our own context are, you know, um, when there's grant dollars or you're pursuing things, how does that work? And when you're gonna kind of innovate um, in the bigger picture, uh, that's more than a day-to-day -day conversation of budgeting. And it's a, it's a, you know, so conversationally becomes uh, lobbying at the state level, getting involved and saying, hey, how do we make this a significant enough issue to where this is important for our state and our educators and our um, government to help uh, put some groups together? And I can tell you, Lee and uh, was part of that conversation. We're putting some industry partners together in some of these panels to have these discussions, which I, I I had always felt like it's, I'm not to say I'm on my own, but it's uh, seeing some industry partnerships uh, in terms of um, concepts is really uh, a very good thing. So musically, how did we react and pivot? And I think there's been some really interesting outcomes that we're going to now retain uh, moving forward. Thank you, Ross. And by the way, for our audience, we will have time during the webinar today and we've reserved some time for questions at the end so for those of you who watch who are watching on our youtube channels don't hesitate we have subject matter experts from the focus right uh, group teams and also from some of our panelists schools and so drop questions there they'll be passed to me i'll be taking a look and we can bring questions in for our panelists as we go along today uh, next uh milton i'm gonna i'm gonna come to you i recently had the uh, good pleasure of sitting in and listening both in conversation with you and with ryan about your programs at uh at Fort Hayes Metropolitan Education Center. And one of the things, you know, to that question of what is CTE and how does it manifest in, in your program for audio, audio and music, you have a very interesting program where students are focused for a couple of years. They've got a certain number of hours they've got to put in the seats and, you know, work on mm -hmm. skills. And tell, tell us about what that is for you. I believe it's Perkins Five funded and t tell us more. Uh -huh. Okay, uh, thanks, uh, Lee, for that question. CTE um, means career technical education. And what that really means, um, without all the technical terms and all the technical parts of it, it means there are kids that are going to want to go right into industry, who are going to want to start their own business, who want to do something other than the traditional track through high school, from high school to college to a job. There are some kids that don't follow that track. So CTE is there as another way to fulfill or reach those non-traditional <coughs> type kids. So um, 
but CTE also does lead to higher education as well, but it's not the only track. So that's what's so interesting about this, uh, uh, the CTE, uh, and I don't wanna say track because tracking is, is not a good term, but it's the pathway. So the CTE pathway. Now, um, when I think about it as the principal and director of the school, I think about the term uh, uh, workforce or the concept of workforce development. And, um, and I'm a musician. I was a band director and orchestra teacher for many years before I became a principal. So, um, you know, in music, what I always was taught was that there are two th three things you can do in music. You can teach, you can be a performer, or you can compose. And that was it. So if you didn't get a job doing one of those three, then music became something that you just kind of fell back on. And a lot of people, even today, still think that. A lot of administrators think that as well. But workforce development was telling me what, what, was, what was pushing me more than anything else was that as I watched the 2000 students walking around on our campus, everybody had on headphones, everybody. So I'm thinking, okay, what are they listening to? Why, why do they have these headphones? Are they listening to a lecture? Are they listening to, you know, a news station? What are they listening to? They're listening to music. They're listening to music. But then I look at our traditional band and orchestra program, and there's not 2,000 students in the band. There's not 2,000 students in the orchestra or the choir, but everybody's listening to music. So I'm saying, okay, we've got to really capture that because there's an interest. And somehow we as traditionalists are missing this whole point or missing the, tra the, 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 the non-traditional students. So we're misaligning. So that's how, uh, how I, I, I um, came up with this, uh, this audio engineering program because there was an opportunity there because kids are at home making music, they're using garage, but they're doing all kinds of things and they're doing it on their own. So we're educators. So the whole point was to begin to teach them that because I didn't want students to learn music and learn music technology despite the school, but I wanted them to learn because of the school. And so, uh, so I had a friend of mine uh, who had taken a couple of my uh, arranging courses and all that. His name is Ryan Van Biver. And he actually was the teacher that followed me in the program that I left when I became a principal, he took my program. And so we had an opening for a traditional band uh, teacher in our, in our school and Ryan had, uh, you know, applied for it. And so we interviewed him, but we had two openings. We had an audio engineering opening and we had a traditional band opening. And so I, I uh, so the committee, we wanted to hire uh, Ryan for the band job, but then the other band director, we wanted them too. So I said, Ryan, you know, I called him that evening. I said, we've got two jobs uh, here. Would you please be thinking about maybe possibly taking our audio engineering Program because I knew he was really smart and he had had some in, had a little bit of experience and um, and so one thing led to another and and we we got this brilliant young man who just took our program and just and exploded but that's that's the whole thinking behind career and technical education this workforce development concept and with all of these thousands of kids listening to music there's there's work there 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 that takes a lot of workforce to yeah. produce that and that's what we yeah can i jump in here i'll just say that <clears throat> in the you know in the if you go to music school to be a music teacher there's a certain set of pathways you can follow but none of those mm -hmm. pathways include producer or engineer that's a different you know there's there's very little bridge in between which is a shame so what i look at my job as doing is providing a path for students into those careers whether they go through higher ed to get more training first or another kind of school to get more training or they get training in a studio. And we've had great success here in the last 10 years with many students, like a substantial 
a substantial portion of each graduating class going into the industry in some way, shape or form. That could be, um, you know, they make a portion or a part of their living doing freelance engineering, recording, um, mixing, or they are making their living full time uh, as a performer. Um, they, you know, we've had students go on to top colleges, uh, Belmont, Berkeley, NYU, uh, Full Sail, um, any, ever, you know, any college, you name it, we've had a kid go there, um, as well as local colleges, uh, Capital University here at Columbus, great music tech school, um, mm -hmm. Tri-C in Cleveland, Hawking College, two years and two year schools and four year schools. In my opinion, it's not an either or. It can be both and. Why wouldn't you present the multiplicity of opportunities available to students and let them select the path that appeals to them? There's hey, Ryan, nothing more democratic than that. Yeah, I'd love to jump in on this, too. And, uh, uh, Milt, when you said something about, you know, what's in their ear, uh, a while ago, one of our superintendents said, you know, we need to make kids focus on literacy in this conversation. And then I thought about, you know, that's awesome. But what about media literacy? And it's the most pervasive thing on the planet. And talk about uh, an economy and a car careers that they can think about. And my feeling back then is we don't do a great, a good enough job teaching concepts of media, not just, hey, how to record per se, but creation, <clears throat> how to tell stories, not in the written word, but whether it's <clears throat> what you hear, how you see it. And that was really struck me. And it go, plays right exactly into the conversation you're saying, Milt, about, you know, this is where their passion is. And if you can find that place to inspire a student to find their interest and spark it. And I can tell you that for in, in, in my program, we've had, you know, obviously, I think we all have, a, you know, numerous outcomes and, and, and placements and everything. But I think for those kids, it, it just sparked an interest that they found maybe a little earlier than they would have, or maybe they wouldn't have. But it's something that, you know, I now that I, we've been doing this a while, every once in a while, I get a call back and or from a student that's doing something, they'll come in and talk to the class and share that they were right where they were and they were inspired uh, by mm -hmm. something. And being able to go into a program and go vertical in it rather than broad and not too focused, uh, it's it's been remarkable. I mean, the outcomes I've seen of you know in in my program and other programs like this have been um, kind of profound, and that really struck me and connected to that comment you made, Milt, about what's in their ear. Like, what are they looking at? What are they watching? Right. It's, it's perfect. Dr. Friedman, I see you nodding your head there in the background. By the way, I yeah. noticed a comment in the chat stream here. Somebody spied some, this is a shameless plug, some red net <laughs> gear in the studio back there. Yeah. So uh, tell us a little bit about your approach with your program. I know you uh, do music, well, tech, and audio. And tell well, us a little bit about the gear, too. Yeah, sure. Why not? Since you did a, a shameless plug. Uh, mostly, <laughs> uh, we did... Um, uh, you know, the, the program has evolved over time. And uh, I'll be perfectly honest, when I first took the job in 2001, I had absolutely no idea what I was doing. And so I realized that kids were like, there were a lot of kids, we've been doing this since 1969. I mean, we have some major players in the industry who graduated from here before I taught. Rob Mathis is a very prominent composer uh, and producer. Um, uh, Scooter, uh, is it, what's his name? Scooter Libby, is that Justin Bieber's manager? Scooter Braun, sorry. Scooter Braun. Scooter Braun. That's what I say. Scooter. Yeah, he's, I mean, there's people, this is Greenwich, Connecticut. There's a lot of people who are well-connected, very wealthy people. We also have a population of people who are not. We have public housing. Um, so I just want to make sure I say that. But um, the program really uh, became, when I was listening to students make their music, it was like, wow, man, they just don't know anything about music concepts and, and composing concepts. And uh, what was that about? So I, I wound up uh, creating a series of um, lessons and classes, the whole class is really about composing music. What is it to be a musician, compose music, to understand music? And kids can take four years of uh, this levels of this. I'm a full-time um, music technology teacher, but really music teacher. So our focus is mostly on teaching music through composition. Um, <laughs> not that there's a a Shameless plug block. here. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. So, um, 
Uh, so yeah, so kids learn about music through composing, like they would learn about music through band or chorus or something like that. We compose and they use, and the technology is what we compose with. And uh, in order to, look, you could play, I'm a percussionist also, don't hold it against me. But I learned how to play my instrument. I studied uh, classical music. I have three degrees in music performance before I, I did my IT degree and uh, learning technologies. And it's like, you know, I think performing is a great thing. It's um, the, and I want kids to perform and I want them to play at the piano. We use the piano keyboard as opposed to a trigger um, because I want them to understand the piano. It's just my, my approach because of my background. Um, and um, so I do want to get to the equipment. We have a brand new lab that we uh, finally got built in a brand new recording studio. And it, it's finally open. I think this is our fourth year. We're open. And when we went to design it and they asked us, what did you want? I said, I wanted top of the line stuff. And uh, why not? It's Greenwich. If we have the money, let's go for it. And uh, we did. We uh, And the band's program got new room and new equipment. Everybody got new, new stuff, the, the entire department. So we have um, Novation um, um, uh, launch keys, right? The, the launch key 61s at every station. And uh, we use a Focusrite um, uh, iTrack solo at every station. So it's a, 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 a two-channel interface. One is for microphone, one's for um, uh, instruments. And uh, they, when they made the recording studio, um, I just said, look, I wanted the best stuff. And so we were Pro Tools here in the recording studio, and we do Logic in the in the lab. So kids learn GarageBand and Logic this year using Soundtrap for all the right reasons. And um, and we're RedNet uh, here because when the people who built this, remember, I, I'm not a I'm not a music technology geek. I'm really not. Uh, but the people we hired a sound design company. They came in. We said we wanted the best stuff. And what did they give us? They gave us Focusrite. And it's a novation and it was absolutely novation keys I picked out myself, I have to say. Okay. Uh, but they uh, uh, it's fantastic stuff. It's just and, and I'm not just saying that because, you know, you found me and it was like I actually found focus right at a conference. I was at. I said, oh, yeah, your stuff is great. We use it all the time. They were like, what? In a high school? I said, yeah. <laughs> and, and Barb, so, in, yeah. In, in the in the in the courses that your students mm -hmm. are embarking on when they come into the program, um, just give us in the audience a quick overview sure. of. What are they? What are they learning? What are the primary topics? What are they walking away from after four years? Yeah, well, I can't help it, but I'm a music teacher, mm -hmm. so everything is based around the general basic concepts of music. So it doesn't matter if it's um, chords, bass, uh, melody. How do you construct all of this stuff? Understanding keys, key signatures. We do work at the piano keyboard. They learn some skills of the piano. They don't learn how to read uh, music notation uh, to play the piano, um, uh, but they learn basics of, of rhythmic notation because it makes a difference in quantizing in the software. And um, the idea is that they understand the basic music concepts. And I teach hip hop and dance music. I mean, I, I, you know, I put, I tell my students now, uh, some of my students, uh, for instance, Kenny Beats is a student, of, was a student of mine. He's, he's now a huge music producer in the industry. Uh, and, um, uh, and he's a great guy. And he's, he comes and he does master classes with our kids here sometimes. And so the idea is that kids learn how to be musicians. And the thing is, is as a percussionist, I started to say, I learned how to play my instrument or instruments as it were. Uh, in a particular context, uh, when you're producing music and creating music, you don't play one instrument. You have to learn about a lot of instruments and you're just not making one track. You're making it all. And then you got to do this thing called balance. You have to be the conductor. That's what a conductor does. It balances the whole thing. That's what a, a producer does or a mixing engineer. And then you have to master it. What do you want it to sound like? Oh my goodness gracious. So there's a lot to learn. There's a lot of steps. The kids have to learn everything. So, um, I teach a lot of contemporary popular music and I got to tell you, I'm 57 years old and I really, uh, I grew up playing in symphony orchestras. I still play in symphony orchestras. I conducted opera and I got to tell you, I, I'm in the road uh, on, on the street and I'm listening to hip hop and people are like looking at me in my gray hair, <laughs> listening to hip hop in my car. And it's, it's because I have to listen to what they're listening to. I have to be able, when they say to me, Frieds, I want it to sound like, you know, uh, you know, Metro boom and bass line. How do I get that 808 to sound like that? I'm like, okay. And then by the time they're seniors, it's like, dude, do not let this grandma shame you into making that. 
you better know, you know, cause I taught you now let's do it, you know? So, uh, it's kind of fun that way. Um, that's so yeah, cool. I don't care what the music is. I really don't care what music they're making. That does not matter. What matters is that they're being musicians, they're understanding how it all comes together. And I'm mm -hmm. training their ears. I'm training their brain. I'm training them to observe. I'm training their ears. And, um, you know, if, 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 if a band director said, or, or choir director said, I want a darker sound, you would teach them the technique of how to make a darker sound, whether they're singing or playing the instrument. And we become experts in that. How do you do that in technology? Well, it's EQ to start with, you know, so let's do that. Um, and it's all learnable stuff. If you're a band director, if you're a choir director, this is not difficult stuff to learn. I, if I could learn it, anybody could learn it. Fantastic. Did I answer your question or did I go off? You did. And you covered a lot of great, a <laughs> right. lot of great ground. Thank you. Next to Leticia and to Luis, a um, couple questions for you. One, Luis, we met, I know during COVID you were able to marshal resources and sort of a backpack or kits for your students to take home and keep their work going. And for you and Leticia also, I'm honored. I was invited to sit on an, an advisory council meeting for your program for the Commercial Music Pathway. And I think our audience would love to hear a little bit about both. So uh, Luis, you wanna start and then Leticia will jump in? Yeah, sure thing. So um, similar to like what uh, Barb was saying uh, about uh, meeting, and it seems like all of us are kind of in the same boat. Like we're, we're trying to meet our, our students where they're at a lot more than having them meet um, the traditional aspect of musical training. Um, and I have similar goals like the most of you here. I think all of us are kind of in the same boat where, where you start to understand how the modern music tools are, you know, analogous to what a composer did with the concert, you know, uh, with, with an orchestra and to concert, you know, uh, a group, right? To put them in a concert and to set your strings in a specific area at a specific distance to create... Uh, a specific um, tonality and, and depending on how many you stack so that you got more overtones because of how many strings you had there and how each instrument would vibrate with each other or, you know, how far ahead or how far behind they were, whether all of that stuff that we would do with acoustics based on feel and sound and experience, we're basically having to learn how to do all of that. But with the new analog, with the new tools, with digital tools, and uh, there's like the more and more I've noticed in, in education keeps pushing into like, well, you have to learn this because it's important. It's like it's it's not that it's not important. It's just like it, it, it's like uh, a woodshop teacher really kind of getting all of their students to learn how to drill a hole with a hand crank drill as opposed to like using an actual electric drill. Like the concept is going to be the same. You're still going to be able to build a cabinet but you are no longer just stuck to a hand drill or a hammer or a screwdriver. Like you have like all of these other modern tools which make the same creativity a lot more efficient, that make the same creativity a lot more accessible too because um, it's easier to learn all of these tools in comparison to the tools of yesteryear. Um, the concepts are the same the goal is the same, the effort is the same, but we need to start catching up with everything we have nowadays. Um, I come from a mixed background of stuff. Like I come from doing YouTube um, and doing camera work and doing lighting and being a technical director for a theater, running all of the line sets and the sound and bussing everything around to, to get different auxiliaries to create different effects and to have um, performers have their monitors and all that and understand signal chaining. I understand how to do lighting. Um, I understand I'm a percussionist too. I was uh, in drumline for many years in high school. And uh, from there on, a lot of it has just been like adaptation, resilience, and uh, the never ending desire to learn. Um, especially because as a teacher, you know, we should be learning in order to teach. And a lot of that learning is learning what our students need in order to give get them where we want them to be not the not the other way where you know we get them to a place that we need because they want to they don't want to they don't want that instruction anymore they want a different type of instruction 
And it's up to us to kind of get to that instruction um, so that they can get to where we want them to be. Um, I'm going to jump in for just a minute and let our audience know if you've got questions for any of our panelists, drop them in the chat on our YouTube channels where you're watching this stream. We're keeping an eye on those questions and I'll be able to tee them up for our panelists. And back to you, Luis. Sure, sure. And uh, yeah, uh, what we're trying to do at our program is is that uh, um, I started off with trying to just have a very accessible program. That's all I really wanted because uh, a lot of the kids, you know, um, they they can take a guitar home and their parents will not freak out about the potential price tag if they break or damage it. Um, you know, a hundred bucks for a guitar, not that bad. You know, three thousand dollars for you know a trombone, it's a little scary, um, especially if kids are skating back from forth from home, taking the bus. You know, things like that start to get kind of uh, difficult, and especially right now during the pa pandemic, if we don't have you know, a, a thousand trombones or a thousand, you know, different instruments for them to take home. Um, it makes music creation a little bit harder. So they all have tools though. So we're trying, I'm trying to train them on the tools that are accessible to them. We're using BandLab just because BandLab is free. And uh, I wanted to veer my, like I wanted to use my funding to give them more tools to use with that free tool. So they have MIDI keyboards that they can play stuff on. So they get the concept of a piano and they get a visual representation of pitches. Um, they have headphones so that they can listen to the music in a better environment as opposed to really crummy laptop speakers. Um, right now we're finishing up a project, which is, you know, we talked about a three, three point story arc exposition con you know confrontation and resolution and we're trying to talk about how we can use samples to just navigate the um the story so we're narrating a story into band lab and we're just dropping samples to try to narrate the story through there i uh, trying to use a, and i think that's the nature of cte is like using practical approaches ra rather than very meta um far-fetched kind of theoretical approaches that are important, but when it comes to the kids understanding, it's not clear enough and it's not fast enough for them to grasp why it's important. So um, I think the practicality of the approach also scaffolds into what they're going to be learning in college anyway, or what they're going to be learning as they practice music anyway. Uh, what, what our job should be, I feel, in the high school environment would be to get them hooked on it so that they want to keep going so that they get those small wins that just get that it clicks and they're ready to keep going and they have a thirst for that knowledge. Um, and then lately, Leticia and I, we've been working a lot on trying to figure out um, how to get the appropriate tools for the kids, you know, how to, you know, get the appropriate funding for that. We've been already finishing up this year. We're already planning for next year when it comes to budget and all that stuff. Um, so it's like a never ending job. And Latisha has been a great help with that as well uh, when it comes to the more logistical aspect of uh, running a CTE program. If yeah, she wants Leticia, to... I'm going to come your way in just a minute to get a little advice for our um, audience about that today. And I'll also ask our producer when you have a chance. We've recently released uh, an expert guide on how to locate, find, and to help you um, make it easier to do the research around funding and finding funding resources for your program. There's an expert guide, a PDF toolkit, You'll see, scroll here on the screen, um, the link. If you just go to that uh, landing page and give us um, an email address, uh, you will get a copy of this guide back, which is 12 pages of really fantastic information that an independent researcher put together for us. And Focus Right and Education is making that available for all of you. Um, so Leticia, to the point where um, Luis left off a moment ago, tell us a little bit about um, how you've been marshalling resources and, and organizing the program, what, what's happening for you? Uh, so we come from a, definitely a district that supports CTE programs. So that's where a lot of the support has been coming from um, in terms of funding, um, reaching out for grants like Perkins and uh, CTEG and other funding sources. So that's definitely where most of the, the funding comes from for that. And one of the great things that they did this year for us, for all the CTE programs, was really sit us down and say, what do you need for distance learning to make sure that your class can happen during distance learning? 
And so having that support from the district really helped all of the programs get some of the, the supplies or get things that they can give out to students and check out to students so that they can take it home. Because a lot of our students don't have um, what they didn't have what they needed to, you know, to do these classes that are very hands-on, and very skills-based. And so that was one of the great things about, our, um, you know, in terms of support um, coming from the district, from the top down there, and um, as well as uh, getting support from advisory board members. I, I'm glad that you mentioned that, Lee, but that that's one of the great places where we get advice from industry partners in terms of, um, you know, industry standard equipment for students, but not just that, but curriculum as well, you know, what's relevant in terms of teaching them what skills do students need to have, what, you know, what do they wish um, future employees would come to their jobs with, and not just with industry partners, but with secondary, um, post-secondary schools as well, just partnering up with those programs and just making sure that what we're teaching our students aligns with, you know, the career that they want to go into or, or pursue later on. Um, and so that's really where I think a lot of our resources come from, you know, district in terms of funding and our, our industry partners, which we get tons and tons and tons of great information from and great opportunities from them. Um, same as uh, partnering up with the South Bay Workforce Investment Board. Um, that's one of the organizations that we partner with to help bring opportunities to our pathways. Um, so that's another great resource there. Fantastic. Thank you, Leticia. I'm going to... Um nerd out for a couple of minutes just because I've had a chance to um to talk with all of you recently I'm gonna I'm gonna throw just a couple of questions first Ryan I'm gonna come to you because I know you've got a bunch of new um, computers for a one-to-one -one. and I I know about some gear we're packaging up to put some things together for your students just like with Luis and Leticia's program and then also I'm gonna then I'm gonna come to you Ross because you've been having some fun with audio over IP on your campus mm -hmm. and um, Peter Tilly, who's on from Focus Right Pro in Education, has been having conversations with you. And then um, third thing for everybody, I'm going to do a quick round robin at the end before we finish up. So I'm going to just seed this for a moment. I'm going to come to each of you and I'd like you to share like within a minute an anecdote about a student. What is this? Think about a student who has come through your program and it changed them in some way. Maybe it changed them between, you know, sophomore and, and junior year, or maybe they're out working and something's happened that you didn't expect. So we're we're gonna we're gonna uh, wrap with that question today and a little bit of a round robin. But um, let's nerd out for just a couple of minutes because I can't help myself. Ryan, tell us about what you're gonna do in your CTE program with the one to one that you're putting together. I think their new MacBook Airs, and then yeah, Ross, that's great. I think folks will just love to hear what you're doing with audio over IP in your program. So uh, our career center, you know, when the pandemic started, we quickly realized that uh, the school is the great equalizer. We um, this the, di the district that I teach in is a high poverty district. Uh, most of our students um, don't have the resources at home to be able to produce high quality music. Um, they don't have the hardware. They don't have the software. Um, we have many students like I have many students um, that if if they don't get food, you know, like extra food to take home on a Friday, they don't eat it over the weekend. It's that, you know, dire of a situation for many of my students. And so um, the school is the equalizer. When they come here, they can work on state-of-the-art equipment and they have all the same tools. And then the only thing uh, that stands in their way is their ability and imagination. But when you go home, you know, you don't have the same tools necessarily. Our CTE department was able to get a grant um, and so starting here at the end of this year, took a little longer, you know, bureaucratic red tape uh, to get it rolling. But we are going to be a one to one MacBook program, all of the media arts programs at our school. So it's about five programs, TV and video, um, photography, graphic arts and design, uh, digital art and my program, audio production. We're all all of our students are going to have MacBook Airs assigned to them. Uh, to take home for the duration of the school year um, at the end of this year, and then they have to bring them back and then they take them home for the duration of next year. Um, and then, you know, we've just received a large shipment of Launchpad and Launchpad Minis that will go along with that. So since I teach Pro Tools and Ableton Live, um, the Launchpads integrate really well with Ableton Live, and they are going to be able to uh, 
learn how to use, you know, learn about MIDI, learn how to use a MIDI controller, um, have that at their disposal. Um, Ableton's great. And I think in the newest update of Pro Tools, uh, finally, there's the ability to have an on-screen MIDI keyboard with your typing keys. Uh, most DAWs have had it for a while. Congrats to Ableton or to uh, Avid for catching up on that. But so about both Ableton and, and Pro Tools um, now have that on-screen MIDI keyboard. So with the launch pad, especially for Ableton, it's going to open up a new world um, of controllerism and just the study of controllerism and what you can do uh, with something like a launch pad. So just more resources to take home. And that's really the next stage in this. This pandemic has taught us. It's really revealed the inequity that we already knew was there. It shined a very harsh light on those inequities. And so it's maybe not good enough anymore for the school to be the equalizer in school. Maybe now we have to push those tools into the homes. Um, and if we can find a way to do that for every kid that needs it, that would be incredible. Thanks, Ryan, for sharing. And so, Ross, tell us a little bit. Uh, we talked uh, before with Barb about her RedNet infrastructure and what she's doing with audio over IP um, for teaching, learning, production, and creation in her facility. We recently had a conversation with your team at your high school. Tell us a little bit about that. And then we'll come around to everybody for round robin. Yeah, no worries. So first of all, I wanted to touch on a couple of uh, things. We we're talking about grants. And Leticia and Luis were mentioning uh, CTIG stands for CTE uh, Technology Innovation Grant in California. And that has funded uh, a, a large part of what I've been doing at least the past three or four years. And I, when I spoke to some of the coordinators of it, they, don't, they did not know the impact it has. I said, someone should do a success story or share because I, I said those were the driving force on my students to be able to innovate. And to be able to come into programs like this and do this is, is profound. I mean, I, I just had to share that. And that uh, grant in particular has been game changing for what I'm doing um, in a di uh, as well. So one of the things we were trying to do, <clears throat> uh, I had, like I said earlier, probably is initiate a kind of a recording project uh, set up for our performing arts. Um, and I had been playing with um, video over IP um, and kind of changing the way our uh, control room works versus pushing these big tools out to every site, football game, football stadium, theater, all that sort of thing. And the network is in place, but not for high bandwidth video. And then once I started to get some more research and see that it's possible with video and it had been thrown around in different protocols in, in the audio world, Dante seemed to be a place that uh, a lot of people are landing on and really be coming into play. So uh, about three years ago, I started researching it and uh, I would look to focus right and some of the things they were doing and some of their implementations. And I have to say, Lee, the six, some of the stories really helped me in my research um, in that, uh, in particular, the story on uh, in Texas of uh, the university, I think it's UT Austin. Um, that had implemented some of these things and seeing how that can play and how, so, so what we set up is uh, Dante um, heading to a mobile rack that we can push anywhere on campus and have just drop it in and do a session and bring that back to our Pro Tools uh, Bay in our, uh, you know, in the, uh, in my studio. Uh, and I will say there is a learning curve to that. Um, where connecting with IT, yes, <laughs> I guess exaggerating, yes, <laughs> and Focusrite has been great at helping connect the dots for us, um, you know, but we're trying to send, you know, six cameras of video, you know, t uh, eight channels of Dante Audio back and forth for announcers, to even just in our live uh, uh, event production, but on the side of uh, recording, the plan is to send back and, and do talk back and the whole thing to various places we wanna do a session uh, in. And the goal for me is to really do like a film scoring session on our stage where the composer and the conductor's there, they're sending it back to our main room and we're talking back and forth. Just, you know, our goal, like Luis is saying, replicate, you know, what is happening in the professional world and give the kids that that hook to say that's amazing and I, I will tell you the outcomes are profound and amazing too so um 
if it's something you're, I, I believe that IP is where it will enable is, is intensely enabling. Um, cause you're not running. I mean, our, our build, we just had our studio done 10 years ago and what we put in XLR cables and cabling. Oh my God. <laughs> it's, it's a fraction just pull, pull, you know, cat six, cat seven, whatever network, and just make sure that there's good coordination with IT. And I think it's it's going to be a profound shift. And moving forward, um, I think it's going to be incredibly enabling. And and the the bridge between musicianship, creativity, and IT and design and all that routing and uh, under you know understand down to controller is is a huge learning opportunity for kids too. So uh, I'm I'm excited where it's going. That's all I could say. <laughs> I, I, what I heard from all of you is providing um, through funding like Perkins, through other resources in your states that, um, and some very careful thinking because you're experts in what you do, music, audio, you're providing real real life, real world, world skills that in career and technical ed education support what's going to happen for, for your students' lives as they go forward for their careers, what they do at home, what they do avocationally with music and sound and video. It's, it's just fantastic. And um, everyone, uh, Ross mentioned a case study. There are uh, at the Focusrite Pro and Focusrite sites case studies on programs. It was the University of North Texas, I think, that was that particular um, case study. And I mentioned earlier in the panel for all of you, our producer will throw up the link again for the expert um, guide for funding, which is also the place to go if you haven't signed up because there are case studies coming on the programs that we're chatting with here today uh, with all of our schools. And uh, the first that will come um, very shortly will be the Fort Hayes uh, Metropolitan Career Center. Uh, Dr. Ruffin and Mr. Van Bibber, thank you for your contributions there. But we've got all these stories, so make sure you sign up so you get access to those. We're coming up to the top of the hour, and I'm going to thank everybody. I, I couldn't be more grateful. What wonderful examples of leadership, of great teaching, and great integration of technology skills and Y'all are doing such a great job for your communities and for your students and families. And uh, I'm super proud and um, just grateful again to have you all here. So, so let's do this. It's a quick rapid fire round. And the question is, you all have students that go through your programs all the time. So in less than a minute, just tell us, a, I, I know Barb, <laughs> she rolled her eyes and said, Lee, really a minute? And about in less than a minute or so, just t tell us, give us one example of something that came from your programs, music, audio, CTE, that surprised you, that inspired you, that just keeps you doing what you're doing every day. So we'll start with Barb and then we'll go to uh, Dr. Ruffin and from there. Um, I, I, and she I, says, thanks Lee for putting thanks, me on the spot yeah. for that one. Well, okay. yeah. I'll, try and be, I'll try and be brief. Um, I mean, we've had thousands of students come through this program and who have, you know, they just, they just thank you. And I think the thing to keep in mind really is that the, these programs don't replace traditional ensemble programs. They fill the gap. Uh, we're not a CTE specific program. We're part of a college based and college track program. So I had, mm -hmm. I had a kid, he just, he was not going to college. He was not doing any of that stuff. And, um, and I, you know, this kid, he, he even got like yelled at because he did some break dancing in the back of the room while I was, <laughs> um, you know, while I was out and he was annoying the, the sub and, you know, it was like, you got to do all sorts of silly homework assignments I gave him. And he just kept coming back to my class and coming back to my class. And I'm like, dude, you have a million dollar smile. You're going to make it. And he went to college and he went and we gave him a, a great um, internship program. And he just kept showing up for interns, showing up, showing up, showing He didn't even leave the internship program when he went to college. He just kept showing up. And they were like, <laughs> your internship is over. He says, I don't care. I'm coming back. And he did it for two or three years till they hired him. Now he is uh, the associate director of tour and marketing of a major record company. Um, I don't want to give it away because I don't want him to be embarrassed about what kind of a brat he was when he was a teenager. <laughs> but I adore him. He's a wonderful guy. And we have a lot of stories like that. Fantastic. Dr. Ruffin, you're up next. And then Leticia, we'll come to you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the, um, there's, this, there's this little kid. His name is Vaughn. And this kid um, was, was really interested in music, interested in art. He was, and he was good with his hands and he was just real creative. 
and he was just a non-traditional kind of little kid. And his teachers recognized that uh, that he was something different about him. So they uh, sent Vaughn to this career, the career, uh, the career center. And so once he got to the career center, he just flourished and he ended up going to college. But the career, but that wasn't the plan for him. But he ended up going to college and he ended up getting like four degrees in music and becoming, you know, uh, a uh, a director of a school in, in a large Ohio city. And that, and as a result of CTE, uh, that, well, that was, his middle name was Vaughn. His first name was Milton <laughs> and his last name was Ruffin. And so CTE has been uh, pivotal in my in entire career. So thank you, Milton. Leticia, you're next then Ross. All right. Uh, well, my story uh, is from one of my students I went through my program since I don't teach art. I mean, I don't teach music, um, but I do come from that CT background as well um, in terms of teaching in the academies. And I taught in the Academy of Cinematic Arts animation. And so for me, it was an animation student. And that really, you know, reminds me a lot of Luis's students um, because I have I had this one girl that she was very, very shy, painfully shy. And just getting to see her grow through the program and um, really use her skills and her interest in animation because that's something that she very much did want to do. And she ended up creating with me um, an art club that ended up um, focusing on animation and whatnot. And then she ended up having other students come and join and just watching her grow um, through her love of like doing animation and doing these courses and getting to socialize more, just seeing that growth. That was one of the very amazing things of these programs. Fantastic. Thank you for sharing Ross, then Ryan. Yeah, this is tough. Um, there's, you know, one. Okay, so I might. Okay, there's one recently. And it's one of those stories of comes in. I will tell you this student, he, he, he would hardly speak. I did not know he had interest. He would kind of wouldn't do his work struggling student. I'm like, okay, I guess he's not interested. You know, you connect dots. And then you talk to him, it's like, eh, you just didn't connect. This is his freshman year. He failed my class. And then I saw him in the next semester. And I said, what are you doing here? He's like, oh, I'm taking the class. So I talked to his counselor. I said, hey, I'm not sure that it's the right connection. He's like, he says he likes it. I'm like, okay. So all of a sudden, we're doing some stuff. And now he, this is in the, the, the video side of the world, but it's, it's, it's a common thread sometimes. And all of a sudden I see this collaborative project they're doing and I'm, I'm looking, it's like, oh, who shot that? And they're like, who did this? And he's like, I did. I'm like, wait, what? You know, so all of a sudden, and he, it became the thing, his hook to school and to pursuing it. He just found what he wanted to do. And by his senior year, you know, he, you know, was really flourishing and still, I mean, struggling and flourishing at the same time. And it was almost like he found something he want to latch into and was something for him to succeed. You know, I mean, the traditional sense of we've had the, Hey, inspired they're in the business now they're doing great. And it, it started here as well. But, you know, so I would say that in general, uh, it, it's, it's, the, I, I have the gamut and it's really been crazy and amazing over my years. Thank you, Ross. Ryan, you're up next. And then last but not least, uh, least, Luis. Ryan. Yeah, so uh, in Michael Eric Dyson's book on Jay-Z, he talks about the concept of bright hustling, um, really hustling in a legal way to make something out of nothing. And I've had two students, I've had many students who exemplify this characteristic. And the two I'm thinking of right now um, took their bright hustling to two different destinations both in the same class. They sat right behind each other. One was a kid named Chris Hearn, and he uh, carried, he did my career center class, which is half a day uh, for two years, and he carried five AP classes his senior year, graduated as the valedictorian, got a full ride scholarship to NYU for music business, won the Columbus Rap Showcase right around the same time. Um, rapper, producer, entrepreneur, started a clothing label out of a duffel bag in my classroom with some other students that remains to this day in stores all around Columbus on social class. Mm -hmm. um, 
went on to uh, give the undergraduate commencement speech at NYU in Yankee Stadium as an undergrad. Um, went to work for Macy's doing event planning for the Northeast. Got an internship with Sony. Worked for the Fader. Um, and is now out in California pursuing a career in music. And he went through college to do it. I also had a student named Malik Keith. He goes by the producer name Ledge Kale. And uh, tried college, wasn't for him. Spent the last dime he had on a one-way ticket to California. Met some producers he had he'd been talking online with out there. Amazing producer, electronic, you know, hip-hop producer, this young man. Um, ended up uh, selling a beat and, and making the beat for a top five billboard hit, I Spy, by Little Yachty. It's gone six times platinum now. Wow. One man went through college all the way, entered the industry. Another young man jumped pretty much straight into the industry. Both paths viable for people who are driven, talented, mm -hmm. studious. Love it. Thank you, Ryan. And Luis, your anecdote. And then we'll close for well, that. I feel like I'm the one with green gills here still because I haven't been doing this long enough for yes. for the the dividends to pay me back yet because uh, I've only been in charge of this program for like about five five years now. So, but what I do experience and I do love about teaching and what keeps me wanting to do this and keep going through the struggles and jumping through the hoops is um, I'm a product of this um, – Area two, I graduated from Hawthorne Scott High School, which is right just down the street from Londo High School, same district. Uh, and I wanted to give back because I noticed a lot of our communities, a lot of Latinos and uh, black folk that are, that the kids tend to struggle with imposter syndrome. I myself was one of those for the longest. And what I've noticed the program does well in, by kind of, I try to do this whole like put your money where your mouth is like when you learn a, a concept you have to go on stage and perform it when you learn that like you have to prove it and then we do like a um a review with a rubric and we always do like a at the end of it like what was good about it what was what could be improved about it suggestions and solutions as they go through the pathway by the end of the pathway when it comes to music and a lot of other aspects of their life they have a lot more confidence in themselves because they've learned how to scaffold small wins and how to take losses not so personally. Um, and the only, I guess, student that I feel like I could say that I, he didn't go into music, but he's uh, finishing up his PhD up north right now uh, when with equity is, is what he's um, uh, doing his dissertation on is like uh, racial equity is what he's working on. And I remember he was one of my drumline students. And one of the things he told me was like that he really appreciated the sense of like how everybody's contributing to either the success or the demise of the score that the drumline will get. It doesn't matter if, every, if, if 10 out of the 15 people are playing it correct, those five people are making everyone kind of. So um, yeah, I guess it's just like that aspect of it. It's just like, constantly trying to push students to find their potential and to really have that confidence and to know how to take losses and use them as a, as a stepping stone into the next level of their life. Thank you, Luis. Thank you all for everything that you do every day. I'm going to give a shout out to Lawndale High School, to Fort Hayes Metropolitan Education Center, to Rancho Bernardo High School, and to Greenwich High School in Connecticut. Great to have all of you here. Can't wait to do it again. Thank you to our audience. And that's it for this afternoon. What a wonderful conversation. Everyone stay safe, be well, and we'll look forward to catching up sometime soon to talk more about career, technology, education, CTE, music, audio, you name it. For Focus Right in Education, I'm Lee Whitmore. Great to have you here today. Take care. Thank you.